Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. So today we're joined by Sir Geoffrey Donaldson. Sir Geoffrey is the leader of the Democratic Unionist Party. He's also the leader of the party in the House of Commons, and he's the UK trade envoy for Egypt and Cameroon. Sir Geoffrey, thank you very much for joining us here today. So there will be an opportunity for you to ask audience questions at the end, but I think we've got quite a bit to talk about. So, so Jeffrey, I'd just like to begin by asking you a bit about your background, growing up in Northern Ireland. Obviously, you lived through the Troubles, but do you remember a more peaceful time before that? And, you know, how did that kind of influence the early formation of your, your political beliefs? Well, David, first of all, thank you for um, inviting me to be here this afternoon. Um, it's been many years since I last spoke in the Cambridge Union, so it's good to be back. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I was born in Northern Ireland in the early 1960s when things were relatively peaceful. So my, the early part of my childhood was pretty much normal. Um, but um, at the end of the 1960s, beginning of 1970s, um, unfortunately, uh, the situation in Northern Ireland became very difficult. Um, violence erupted. Um, uh, I think the, the first big moment for me um, as a child in what became known as the Troubles was August 1970. My cousin was a police officer serving in a place called Cross Maglen in South Armagh, right on the border between um, County Armagh and County Louth. Uh, and he was um, the first RUC officer, the Royal Ulster Constabulary with the police in Northern Ireland at that time. He was the first RUC officer along with his colleague to be murdered by the IRA in what became known as the Troubles. And I remember the impact that had on my family. Um, we were a large family in a very small rural community. And so losing a member of the family in those circumstances was very difficult. Sadly, that was to be replicated many times for many other families in Northern Ireland. And I suppose from that moment in 1970, I, even though I was still a child, I took an interest in the politics of Northern Ireland, what was evolving in Northern Ireland. Um, and that interest continued right through my teenage years. And, and then um, I became involved actively in politics at the age of 18. And I would say that the reason I got involved so early um, was because of what was happening around me and and therefore um, my involvement, my entry into politics was very, very much shaped by what was happening in Northern Ireland at the time. So very much you, you're entering politics as soon as you can, you know, at the age of 18 with that kind of the killing of, of your relative and, and many others sadly in Northern Ireland being the real driving force behind that. What were you then seeking to achieve through your politics? Obviously, securing peace in Northern Ireland and moving forwards. Um. Well, my father um, had served for quite a number of years as a part-time soldier um, during the early years of the Troubles. And um, I could see that uh, the, 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 you know, the, the, the conflict was continuing, the violence was continuing. And increasingly, I came to the view that, you know, the, 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 there needed to be a political solution, that there wasn't going to be a security solution to the problem in Northern Ireland. Um, that, you know, putting more police officers, more soldiers onto the streets wasn't going to cure the problem. Um, and that's why I turned to politics, because I felt that politics had the potential at least to... Um, offer a way forward in terms of people trying to find solutions rather than just putting a sticking plaster on, on the wound. You know, you've spoken a bit there about finding solutions to problems. Obviously, Northern Ireland is a very fractured society, very, you know, diametrically opposed political beliefs. Would you say that that's a unique challenge of being a politician in Northern Ireland? Or, you know, would you say it's reflected in your experiences of what you've observed elsewhere around the world. I know we were speaking over lunch about kind of your work overseas in, in kind of being an ambassador for peace um, in other countries. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, when I talk to my colleagues uh, in Parliament, I've been an MP for almost 25 years, and I talk to my colleagues from England, Scotland, and Wales, their experience of being a public representative is very different from mine, and particularly in the early years of my political involvement. Um, you know, being involved in politics in Northern Ireland brought risks with it. Um, I spent an, a large part of my early uh, years as an MP with close protection everywhere I went. Um, sadly, we see today, even in England, um, MPs being targeted in that way. But that was that was a regular feature of political life in Northern Ireland. Indeed, last weekend, we just marked the 40th anniversary of the murder um, of a unionist MP um, in Northern Ireland. And that reminded me just of how perilous it was to be a, a frontline politician in those years, um, and not just on one side. Um, so, you know, that experience inevitably shapes how you approach politics. But I think we've seen quite a transformation in recent years in Northern Ireland. And when I look at the politics now compared to the politics that applied when I first became involved, it's very different. Northern Ireland is changing. The, the, the politics of Northern Ireland is changing. The way that people identify with politics is changing. So, you know, it, it, slowly but surely, Northern Ireland is emerging from that era of what we call the Troubles, and its politics is beginning to, 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 to be transformed, to change. Not fully yet. I mean, the political institutions created under the Belfast or Good Friday Agreement still reflect the, the divisions within our society, but even that is changing. You've talked a bit about Northern Ireland kind of moving forwards. You know, there's more cohesion nowadays in the region. That's certainly been a gradual process. I mean, the conflict lasted for, for over 30 years. Um, what would you say recently has been the turning point sort of moving forwards through to my generation? We don't necessarily see these green and orange divides that, that really did haunt the previous generations. I think there were a number of turning points in, in our journey from conflict to peace in Northern Ireland. But actually, one of the more significant moments was, was something that happened that was external to Northern Ireland, but I think actually had a, quite an impact on the dynamic of the peace process. And that's 9-11. Um, and you might think, well, what's the relationship between 9-11 and the politics of Northern Ireland? The Irish Republican movement very much looked to the United States of America for support not only for its political efforts, but also for, frankly, its, its armed campaign. Much of the funding for the IRA came from sympathizers in the United States of America. Um, the IRA had been on ceasefire, and uh, you know, we were, we'd had the Good Friday Agreement. Um, we were trying tentatively to take that process forward. Um, but there was always kind of, you were always looking over your shoulder, is there the possibility we can slide back towards violence again? I think the attacks on America, um, the 9-11 attacks, very subtly but very clearly changed the dynamic in that the thought that Americans would be supporting a campaign of bomb bombing London. And the IRA's biggest lever, if you like, biggest pressure point on the British government was its ability to hurt the British economy. And, and, and exploding bombs in London was a big part of the IRA's, the latter years of the IRA's campaign, um, particularly in the city of London, designed to really hurt the British government and hit them hard. Um, the, of course, post 9-11, the UK was a strong ally of the United States. And the idea that there would be sympathy for exploding bombs in London at that time just wasn't realistic at all. And I think, in a way, that helped to close the gate behind the, 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 the you know, the, the, the violence that, that people were kind of more locked into the peace process at that stage. There was only one way to go. The idea that you could kind of go backwards and, and go back to the violence of the past, I think, uh, you know, given the reliance on of Irish Republicans on that American support in particular, um, th there was a new dynamic there. And, and you saw from that moment on more of a focus on making the agreements, the political institutions work, 
right up to 2005, six, when we got IRA decommissioning, um, Sinn Féin finally signing up to support um, the police and the rule of law, and the unionists agreeing to share power with Sinn Féin. So that, you know, that's, that's by no means the only moment when things change, but that was actually a dynamic introduced into the process that you know, was beyond the control of anyone um, on the island uh, or in these islands. It's really interesting to hear your perspective on how these external influences have, you know, really moved politics inside Northern Ireland forwards into the 21st century. Looking more internally, I know you were involved in negotiations for the Good Friday Agreement on the Ulster Unionist Party side, but I'm also aware that you you walked out of those negotiations. Could you tell us a bit more about your thought process there and how that feeds into, of course, nowadays you're working um, in Northern Irish politics, effectively implementing the agreement and the institutions that it established? Well, the negotiations had concluded um, at Stormont. It was the 10th of April, 1998, the day the agreement um, was brought to a conclusion. Um, And I was part of the, uh, I was a senior negotiator in the Ulster Unionist negotiating team. The, The unionism was divided at that time. Some of the unionist parties were out of the talks process. They left when Sinn Féin entered the talks. The, the unionist party, the Ulster Unionists, stayed in. So they were, one, they were one part of unionism in the talks. The rest of unionism was out. The Ulster Unionist negotiating team was, was fairly evenly divided over um, the Good Friday Agreement. And there was a big debate that day within the negotiating team about whether or not we could support the agreement. I think the crucial factor for me uh, was I felt, I mean, the agreement you know, proposed new um, political institutions. It, it dealt to an extent with the political, with the constitutional arrangements for Northern Ireland. But um, it was in relation to how it dealt with the legacy of, of our conflict that I think was was most problematic for me. And whilst there was a proposal in the agreement that all of the prisoners linked to the various paramilitary organisations would be released from prison, there was very little by way of proposals to support the victims and the thousands of people who'd been impacted by the conflict. Um, And I felt that that was a huge flaw in the agreement, that it didn't provide for, you know, processes whereby people could uh, pursue truth, about what had happened in the Troubles, continue to pursue justice, even if it meant those who were convicted of crimes would only serve a short time in prison. Um, And and really, I felt the agreement fell way short on dealing with the legacy of the conflict. And here we are, you know, we're over 20 years on from the agreement and we still haven't resolved those issues, David. We're still dealing with, and the government is now proposing a legislation to deal with legacy in Northern Ireland, which will introduce what's called a statute of limitations. In other words, it is unlikely there will be any further prosecutions in Northern Ireland for crimes linked to the conflict. So we're still dealing with that. We didn't deal with it in 1998. And that was, I felt, a big flaw in the agreement. And as someone who'd lost family members, people that I knew, friends I grew up with, I just felt that you know the agreement was letting those people down. Well, you've somewhat preempted where I was going to going to take you next, which is, you know, are victims adequately supported today? But just carrying on from what you've what you've, what you've just said, would you agree that kind of amnesties and releasing prisoners was was kind of a key um, aspect of getting both sides to to sign up to the agreement? And looking back in terms of how the Good Friday Agreement has despite of the, the parts that you disagree with, has catapulted Northern Ireland forwards um, in, term, in terms of peace. Um, would you say that overall, on reflection, it was a good thing or a bad thing? Well, look, um, we've come a long way since then, and, and clearly some of the, the, the flaws in the original agreement have been corrected, and there have been subsequent agreements that have strengthened the process in that sense. So yes, I mean, I think with those corrections along the way, we've, we've, we've come a long way on our journey. Um, and, uh, you know, that's why today, you know, we're implementing, 
um, the agreements. We're seeking to take forward the political institutions. I do think that as we approach the 25th anniversary of the agreement that maybe it's time to take stock again and look at how we can improve the way that we do things. I think there is a need to reform the way that the political institutions in Northern Ireland operate. I think that we need to break out of this very divisive um, system of government that we have um, that kind of entrenches us in the politics of the conflict and carries forward the debate around what happened and, and, and bring a, a new focus um, to those institutions, which is more about the future, more about what's the kind of Northern Ireland we want for the future, rather than you know, constantly looking to the past. Of course, we can't forget the past. Of course, you know, we have to recognize that we went through some very dark years and we need to learn from the lessons, particularly of the mistakes that were made during that period. There needs to be proper acknowledgement of what happened then from all sides. But I think, you know, we need a process that gets us to a point where we can begin to be much more forward focused. Looking then at your party's own perspective in terms of this this forward focus, I'm sure we're all aware your party's been criticised in the past for its stance on on things like gay marriage. Um, What would you say to a gay person in Northern Ireland who's perhaps concerned that your party can't adequately represent them? And where do you kind of see the position of your party moving going forwards? Well, I think it's true, and I've said this as uh, since I became leader of the party. I think my party has said things in the past that clearly were hurtful, particularly to people from the LGBT community. I think that we need to take forward a discourse in Northern Ireland that is much more respectful that where we disagree and where we differ on things, including on social issues that we differ well, we disagree well, that we disagree respectfully. Um, and, uh, you know, that we, and I recognise that, you know, Northern Ireland is changing, Northern Ireland society is changing, uh, that our politics needs to be much more inclusive, uh, generally. Uh, we need to recognise the changes that have occurred in society. That does not mean there can't be a place in society and in politics for people who hold a perspective which is, you know, strongly faith-based perspective. Um, but uh, by the same token, I think, there is a recognition that where people hold strong views, they should do so in a respectful way. And one of the things I want to do as leader of the party is is to recognise the need to engage more, to um, uh, to have you know a, a, a more respectful discourse on these issues going forward. Would you say that moving forwards, there's the opportunity for kind of people from all backgrounds, including gay people, to play an active role, not only in Northern Irish politics, but within your own party, the DUP? I think uh, any party that wants to be successful needs to reflect the society that it comes from. And, and uh, you know, whilst the DUP has many members who come from a very strongly faith-based perspective, there is room in the DUP for people who hold different views. Uh, we are, if I may use the term, a very broad church when it comes to people's views on a wide range of issues. And that reflects where society is and the, and the fact that society is changing. Um, and, you know, the, the DUP is, is not immune to that change. Um, you know, as a unionist, uh, I feel very strongly that people who live in Northern Ireland, you know, I, if, if we want support for the union to be strong, then people from whatever background need to feel that their place in the union and in Northern Ireland is respected and, and that Northern Ireland is an inclusive place. Really going back to that that point which you've made throughout your remarks so far and, and which you emphasised over lunch of the need to bring everyone forwards with you. You know, we can't continue to have such a, such a fractured society. Now, another major point of change, um, not only in Northern Ireland, but across the UK recently, Brexit. Um, Brexit has certainly been a major point of contention in Northern Irish politics. Um, recently, particularly surrounding the Northern Ireland Protocol, um, which of course aimed to balance um, the need to implement the democratic wishes of the people in the, um, in the UK um, to secure Brexit 
with the need or the perceived need, perhaps you'll disagree, to maintain a soft border on the island of Ireland in order that the peace process can continue to move forwards. Now, there's a lot we can touch on in terms of Brexit, so I'll try and take things chronologically. I assure you we'll, we'll try and get through as much of it as we can. I want to start quite early on in terms of the, the, be the Brexit process um, with the confidence and supply arrangement. Now, the confidence and supply arrangement, which of course your party made with Theresa May's Conservative government back in, in 2017. I'm curious to know how you feel about that, agree that agreement, um, of course, now with the way that you might feel you've been treated by the Conservative, Conservative Party since. And if you had been leader at the time, would you have done anything differently? Well, um, the, the, the results of the 2017 general election, I think, caught many people by surprise. The Conservatives were expected to win a comfortable majority and didn't. Uh, and this came at a critical time. Uh, and I think Theresa May's decision to call a general election was, was a huge mistake on their part. Um, you know, she had a working majority at that time. Um, there was a lot that needed to be done in terms of taking forward the decision in the referendum to leave the European Union. Um, and the result of the general election meant that the capacity of Parliament to legislate on you know, what were very controversial issues linked to Brexit was, was greatly diminished because Parliament was deeply divided on this and you know, across party lines as well as across the Chamber. And you know, in all my time in Parliament, I think those were the most fractious years that I've witnessed, in, particularly in the House of Commons. But also, of course, the House of Lords had an important role to play as well. Look, you know, we're a small party, um, but we could bridge the gap between the Conservatives um, ha not having a majority and having a majority. So, you know, carpe diem, um, we, you know, we, we negotiated, um, got an agreement um, with the Conservatives. And, um, you know, I, I, I think that if I'm honest, um, you know, I, I, I think, I don't think Theresa May's heart was in Brexit and therefore it, it, it wasn't so much in any way, really, our relationship with the Conservative Party during that period that drove the, 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 the difficulties that the government encountered in, in taking forward Brexit. I, I just, I think that uh, Mrs May, if I'm honest, I don't think she fully understood the Northern Ireland problem and where that fitted in on Brexit. Um, and, and that led to tensions. I remember once towards the end of 2017, I think it was, you know, where, where she flew off to Brussels one morning to sign a joint report with the EU. And, and, you know, when we got the text of that report and saw how it was dealing with the Northern Ireland issue, we were, you know, we just couldn't believe it. And, you know, we said to Mrs. May, I'm sorry, but, you know, if you go with this, we can't support this. Do you wish that you had been consulted more on issues like that? And what would you say to members of the Conservative Party, Conservative politicians, in terms of the way that Northern Irish politicians um, in particular have been treated throughout the Brexit negotiations? I don't think Northern Ireland has been given the attention it deserves in the whole debate about Brexit. Uh, there would, are some who would argue that Brexit has more to do with you know, England and English nationalism and that it has to do with the UK. I'm not sure that's true. I think there is a UK issue in all of this. Maybe if the EU had offered David Cameron a better deal in terms of reform, you know, we might not have got to where we are, but we did. Um, and I think in truth that, uh, you know, when it, when it came down to it in 2019, um, Boris Johnson wanted to get Brexit done. The House of Commons was in disarray. His ability to land a majority for anything on Brexit was greatly diminished. He, you know, there had been a number of um, defections from the Conservative Party. So even with the DUP support, the government didn't have an overall majority. And I think in, 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 in his desire to get Brexit done, to an extent, Northern Ireland was kind of 
I won't say sacrifice, but the EU exploited the weakness of the of the government at that time, ruthlessly exploited the weakness of the government, and the Irish government in particular were pushing in the on the EU side an agenda which was very much about, on the face of it, avoiding a hard border on the island of Ireland, but very subtly seeking to separate Northern Ireland out in terms of the the, the withdrawal agreement from the rest of the UK. It's interesting how you say um, kind of your belief that the Irish government has been incredibly influential in terms of lobbying on the protocol in Europe. And it's something that I'd like to kind of draw comparisons with something which you said over lunch in terms of the strength of the, the Irish lobby in, in Washington, D.C. Is this something that is is matched on the unionist side? And if not, how do you see unionism tackling that issue moving forwards? The, the, the Irish government and the Irish diplomatic service punches way above its weight in international terms. Um, uh, you know, and our difficulty is that we're a region of the United Kingdom. So we don't have a diplomatic service. We don't have Northern Ireland representation around the globe. The Irish government does. And some of the most effective diplomats I've ever met are in the Irish Foreign Service, and in particular in places like Washington and in Brussels. I mean, you know, look, credit where it's due. When it came to Brexit, the Irish government, um, you know, were very strong, very influential in the EU side. Essentially, the Irish government set the agenda uh, in relation to Northern Ireland and the Brexit negotiations. And whilst we, of course, sought to use our influence with the UK government side, I think the weakness of the UK government meant that it was very difficult for us to get that through. Um, more generally, um, you know, the, the, uh, in the United States, one of the frustrations I have is that when you look at the Irish diaspora in the United States, you know, up around half of it is actually, you know, originally Ulster Scots Presbyterian. And yet, the people who came out from Ireland as Presbyterians went out pre the war, the Revolutionary War, fought on the side of the rebels, became unhyphenated Americans, and integrated into American society. The 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 the, 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 the Catholic Irish emigration came more so at the time of the famine, um, post the Revolutionary War, and and you know, tend to, tend to populate the large American cities like Chicago, Boston, New York, and, and became very much a, a strong Irish American lobby. I mean, became a distinct group that is still very, very strong today, even in Congress. You've got an Irish American caucus. There is no equivalent of that on the unionist side, even though, you know, the, Ar the Irish American population or the population the, of uh, you know, Americans that has, has roots on the island of Ireland, around about half of them are actually, you know, Ulster Presbyterian roots, but it, they are not a distinct political or ethnic grouping in America. As I say, they they were there very much. They were frontiersmen. They were there pre the Revolutionary War, and that means that when it comes to, you know, how Ireland is dealt with in Congress, those Irish American influences that would be supportive of the Irish nationalist cause tend to be a, much, a lot more vocal than those who might be more sympathetic to the, the unionist cause. And obviously, as you're saying, then this having an impact due to the, the US having such a strong position on the international stage with the Irish lobby being, meaning then that the US is, is particularly sympathetic um, to the nationalist cause. Um, moving back then to kind of Brexit, uh, particularly focusing on the Northern Ireland Protocol. Your party has been very, very critical on the Northern Ireland Protocol. Perhaps you could just summarise your objections for the benefit of the Chamber. Kind of let us know which kind of are the key parts which you'd seek to change and what you think that the UK government has to do in order to get that change from Europe. Well, Section 1 of the Good Friday Agreement talks about Northern Ireland's relationship with the United Kingdom and at the heart of that is the principle of consent, and it says very clearly there should be no change to the constitutional status of Northern Ireland as part of the United Kingdom unless the majority of people in Northern Ireland decide otherwise. Um, and, you know, the protocol does uh, alter Northern Ireland's relationship with Great Britain 
the High Court of Belfast recently ruled that the EU withdrawal agreement and the Northern Ireland Protocol, which is an integral part of that agreement, impliedly repeals sections of Article 6 of the Act of Union. And Article 6 of the Act of Union prohibits barriers to trade within the United Kingdom. The protocol creates barriers to trade within the United Kingdom in contradiction of Article 6 of the Act of Union. So this alters the relationship between Northern Ireland and Great Britain and crucially uh, alters it in economic terms because one of the strong points uh, for me as a unionist is the economic argument and the protocol cuts across that because um, it is resulting in a diversion of trade. It is resulting in people, uh, companies in Northern Ireland finding it increasingly difficult to access their traditional supply chains in Great Britain. It's, you know, I've lost count of the number of times I've had constituents contact me because they've gone online to order stuff, um, products, goods from suppliers in Great Britain. The message comes up, not available in Northern Ireland. And that is now a regular feature of life in Northern Ireland. So, you know, for as a unionist, you know, I just find it inexplicable that a, a UK government that says it supports the union would continue to countenance um, a protocol that disrupts trade within the United Kingdom. And I think that needs to be resolved. I don't want a hard border on the island. I am not arguing for that. I accept that in any arrangement, we have to have pragmatic solutions that enable the EU to protect the integrity of the single market. But fundamentally, and consistent with Article 1 of the Belfast Agreement, it should also protect Northern Ireland's right to trade freely within the United Kingdom itself, and the protocol disrupts that. So what would be the ideal resolution to the situation from the DUP's perspective? I think there are practical solutions there. I mean, I've um, had presentations from a number of companies that uh, demonstrate that you know, nowadays, um, with modern technology, you can differentiate uh, between the movement of goods staying within the United Kingdom and the movement of goods that are flowing across the Irish border. Um, and, you know, when you, you see this in everyday life, you go on and order something. Um, I'm not going to be commercial. I won't mention a particular company, but you order something online, uh, if it's still available in Northern Ireland, um, you know, that you, you'll get a message saying it's left the warehouse, it's on in transit, it's arrived in Belfast, it's been dispatched from the warehouse in Belfast, it's arrived at your home, and you'll get a photograph of the parcel at your gate. You know, full transparency, full, um, you know, traceability of the movement of that um, product from Liverpool or Manchester to Tremor in County Down. And why on earth can't we use that? I mean, that technology is there. To, you know, and, and nowadays you can do it for a whole shipment. So if you've got a truck with different products, different pallets of going to different destinations, you know, I've seen the device. You, you, you put a seal on the back of the truck um, and, and you scan that seal, it will tell you every item that's in that truck, where it's come from, where it's going to, the customs, uh, you know, any customs declarations that are required if it's going into the Irish Republic. So, you know, there are practical solutions that are available. At the moment, I think the politics is getting in the way of the practical solutions. If I'm honest, I think the EU wants to punish the UK for having left, um, wants to send a very clear message to other EU member states, don't even think about it. Um, and to an extent, there is a desire to use Brexit to kind of create problems for, for you know, internally within the UK. And on the, EU, uh, the UK side, the weakness, I think, at the time, of the UK's government, the government's negotiating position resulted in what we have now. So I, I want practical solutions, um, you know, that, and that doesn't require a hard border anywhere. In terms of the way that your your party has gone about seeking these resolutions, I know a lot of other politicians in Northern Ireland have been critical of your party's approach recently, um, including from the the likes of the UUP. Um, about the decision and the refusal to send ministers to, to north-south ministerial bodies. Would you agree that such an approach undermines the peace process? And what, in, in your view, makes it worth it? I don't think it undermines the peace process, but it, there is no doubt that um, you know, with the impact the protocol has had on east-west relations, so the protocol impacts Northern Ireland's relationship with the rest of the UK. 
that is a so the Good Friday Agreement, the Belfast Agreement, um, is it, it, it is built around three sets of relationships: internal to Northern Ireland, the relationship between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, and the relationship between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK, and the, so the East West relationship. The protocol harms the East West relationship. And no one can dispute that. That is a fact. And our view is, as unions, well, we need to sort this out. This needs, this impacts and on and undermines a very delicate constitutional balance that is at the heart of the agreement. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, sometimes when I listen particularly to American commentators, they tend to look at the peace processes almost as if it's an agreement between Irish nationalism and the British government. And unionism, kind of doesn't get factored in. But, you know, the agreements are actually agreements between unionists and nationalists. And unionist consent, unionist support for the political institutions, for the very delicate constitutional balance that is at the heart of these agreements is an essential requirement. Every bit as much as national support and consent for this. Now, I, I recognise that there are strong views on both sides on Brexit. People are divided on Brexit. Um, but we need to manage that. We need to manage our way through that. And so our view is very simple. You know, the Irish government says they support the protocol, recognizing the harm it does to east-west relationships. And our view is, well, look, we can't have normal north-south relations when the east-west relationships are being impacted in this way. And that's just the simple political reality of where we are. I don't want that to be the case. I want this to be sorted out quickly. I've said that to the government. I've said that to Mara Sefcovic who um, is leading the EU negotiating team. Let's get this sorted out. There are practical solutions that can restore the very delicate balance at the heart of the agreement and get us back onto an even keel so that we can move forward. Um, and that's where I want to be, and the sooner the better. In terms of unionist consent to be a part of the Northern Irish institutions and looking forward in a world where the situation surrounding the protocol doesn't change, where... Prime Minister Boris Johnson, as far as you're concerned, continues to, to ignore the views being expressed by, by unionists in Northern Ireland. What do you see the outcome as being? I know in recent days and weeks, um, you've made media appearances where you've said that the DUP will be prepared to pull down the Northern Irish Assembly. Is that something that you will carry through? And where do you think that would leave Northern Ireland? Well, the the assembly was down for three years and was restored again on the basis of what was called the New Decade, New Approach Agreement. And an essential part of that agreement was a, U, a commitment by the UK government to protect Northern Ireland's place in the UK internal market. That was a key commitment in the New Decade, New Approach Agreement. And that was the basis on which we went back into government. Now, that has not been honoured. The UK government has not taken steps to restore Northern Ireland's place within the UK internal market. The protocol cuts across that. And I've said very clearly to the government who are continuing to implement other aspects of New Decade, New Approach. Well, if you're going to do this other stuff, but ignore the elephant in the room, then you know, that's not a sustainable position. Unionism in good faith um, uh, supported New Decade, New Approach because it included measures to protect Northern Ireland's place within the UK internal market. And we expect the government to honour that commitment. If they don't, then we will have to review our position in regard to our participation in the political institutions. Because then I think it is unreasonable to expect unionists to preside over institutions that are being used to implement things that are harmful to the union. Um, uh, and, and that is not a position I want to be in. Uh, I don't want to be in a position where we um, can't participate in the political institutions. That's not the outcome I want. I want to see, uh, and we've got these negotiations happening at the moment, I want to see progress. I want to see the EU and the UK government reaching a sensible agreement on how we deal with the issues and the problems created by the protocol. I recognise that you've said that the collapse of the, the Northern Ireland Assembly isn't the the outcome um that you want. Obviously, um, the DUP and indeed all the other parties in Northern Ireland have put a lot of effort into the political resolution of um, the conflicts, healing past wounds. But the fact that you now consider that it might be necessary to pull down the institutions of government in Northern Ireland, 
do you think that there's a risk that, you know, the attempts at political resolution to the conflict have failed? Um, I know in recent weeks, um, many of you have probably seen on social media videos of, of buses being set on fire in the streets of Belfast. Looking at this return to violence and the potential failure to find a political resolution, what does that mean for Northern Ireland? Well, look, the first thing I want to say is I don't want to pull down political institutions. I'm simply saying that we can't continue to participate in a government that is implementing something that is harmful to the union. And look, that's the right of any political party. Uh, you know, if, if other parties have withdrawn from the executive in the past because they felt that what was happening in the executive, you know, wasn't consistent with their view of where the political institutions should be. Um, and, you know, uh, therefore my party has the right to say, well, look, uh, you know, our ministers are being asked to implement things that they don't agree with. Um, uh, and they have no say in. So, you know, we're, we're, we, we are now in the position in Northern Ireland where we have to accept EU regulations and we have no say whatsoever in how those regulations are drawn up. And yet our ministers in the executive are required to impose those regulations without any accountability or any say. Now, that's not a sustainable position. And uh, that, that's why we need this protocol to be addressed. I'm not talking about pulling down institutions. I'm simply talking about exercising our right to withdraw from uh, uh, government uh, that is being required to impose things that we don't agree with. What happens then is you have an election and the people get their say. Now, I hope we can get to a place where agreement is reached and these things are resolved um, and we don't have to withdraw our ministers from the executive. So to be clear, I'm not talking about withdrawing from, from the assembly. I, I recognize the need for Northern Ireland to have uh, its own legislature and its own government, but I'm just not prepared as a unionist to impose laws and regulations that I believe are harmful to the union. In terms of the peace process, yes, of course, um, uh, the scenes of people burning buses in Belfast damages Northern Ireland, it damages the image of Northern Ireland, it damages our ability to attract investment, and it serves no purpose whatsoever. And we've been very clear, as of you know, all the political leaders, that violence has no part and no place in how we resolve these issues. But I am concerned um, that you know, we need to demonstrate clearly that politics works, and that where people have concerns, whether they are unionist or nationalist, that the political process has the ability to address and resolve those concerns. That's why it's important we do get um, um, progress on resolving the issues around the protocol in a way that you know, people can support so that we can demonstrate that politics works and violence isn't the way forward. Is the peace process itself working? I know that many groups in Northern Ireland have taken in recent weeks a much more extreme stance. Um, the Loyalist Communities Council, which represents the views of the three main Loyalist paramilitaries groups, alarmingly um, withdrew their support for the Good Friday Agreement, um, with the Progressive Unionist Party becoming the first party to say that there's no longer a basis for unionists to support the agreement. How would you reflect on, on the views being expressed by those other groups? And how do you think that your party can play a role to ensure this continued political approach to the resolution of our differences? Well, we need to be able to show that politics works and that, that we can resolve these issues politically. I think that's the most powerful message we can send to those who might be contemplating the prospect that somehow violence has a part to play in any of this. It doesn't. And I don't think actually where that is where those groups are. I just think that politically they feel that the government hasn't listened to them. I feel that, um, or they feel that the EU hasn't listened to them, that their support for the agreements and the political institutions is being taken for granted. Um, and so I think it's an expression of their frustration um, rather than a strategic decision to turn away from politics and perhaps to turn back to violence. I don't think that's where those groups are. But I think nevertheless, we shouldn't ignore we should not ignore the strength of feeling that there is uh, in unionist communities across Northern Ireland about the harm this protocol is doing. 
where does this all leave us, um, Sir Geoffrey, heading into the next election? Well, we have an assembly election next May. Um, at the moment, uh, Sinn Féin are doing well in the polls, both in Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. I think there's a real prospect that Sinn Féin will be the largest party in the next Irish general election and be in a position where they can be instrumental in the formation of the next Irish government. I think that presents real challenges for unionism. Uh, I, I don't think that unionism can indulge in the luxury of being as divided and fractured as it is. So one of the things I want to do um, in unionism is to try and pull unionism back together again, to have a more cohesive unionist movement um, that stabilize, helps to stabilise the situation in Northern Ireland. Actually, it's in everyone's interest that we have, you know, people, communities feel that they have strong political representation and that politics works. And I think um, from my perspective, obviously, uh, you know, we want to, we've been the largest party in Northern Ireland now for getting on for 20 years. It's difficult to sustain being the largest party in any society for that length of time. And that's why, you know, the, the, the DUP needs to adapt to changing circumstances, needs to broaden its support base and needs to strengthen that cohesion within unionism, certainly in advance of the elections in May. Um, and if, you know, I think it, it would be very significant if Sinn Féin were to win the elections next May. And from my perspective as a unionist, that's certainly not an, an outcome that I would want to see happening. Focusing in on the need to maintain the stability of the democratic institutions in Northern Ireland, if the outcome of the next election was that Sinn Féin won a majority, would you enter an executive with them? Well, that is a decision we will have to contemplate. Um, we're not in a position yet because we're months out from an election, but clearly, um, you know, you have to respect the outcome of elections. And you have to consider then and, you know, all, I mean, it's, it's like any situation where, you know, you've no party has an overall majority and that will certainly be the case in Northern Ireland where no party is an overall majority and where you're looking at a coalition government, then parties have to decide do they want to be part of that government or not. At the moment, we have a mandatory form of coalition government in that if a party wins a, a certain percentage of the, the the seats, they reach a certain threshold, they automatically are entitled to be in the executive. I would like to change that in the future, not on you know the grounds of party political or sectarian grounds, uh, but I just think it's healthier for a democracy if you have voluntary coalition where you hold an election, you look at the party strengths, the parties negotiate a programme for government and decide who's in and who's out. Um, and that's where I'd like to get to a more normalised system of government in the future where, you know, people stand for election and then negotiate um, the basis for being in government. Actually, I think that's a more cohesive, stronger way to do government because then people are more committed, I think, to an agreed program for government. At the moment, you know, it's not quite, we have a five-party five coalition in Northern Ireland and, and, you know, five parties at opposite ends of the political spectrum. And, you know, COVID and the pandemic has really tested that government. And I think actually we've come through, you know, quite well but it is difficult decision making in a five party coalition where you have people, parties at either ends of the political spectrum. It doesn't make for an easy way to do government. I'm just conscious of the fact that we, we did start this, um, this event late. So I think I'll now take the opportunity to open this up to, to floor questions. So um, if any members of our events team have microphones um, to the gentleman here. Thank you very much for your remarks, Sir Geoffrey. Um, you spoke about how Brexit is sort of shaking the constitutional foundations of Northern Ireland because it's a very fragile um, situation. But, you know, the elephant in the room is Brexit is a fundamental constitutional shift of Northern Ireland. And as a unionist, it was obvious to me in 2015 and 16 and to anyone with half a brain cell that there was no outcome of Brexit that wouldn't fundamentally shake uh, the constitutional position of Northern Ireland. With that in mind, do you accept that the DUP made a mistake in supporting any form of Brexit? Um, and do you think that you fundamentally damaged unionism and that's why you're being punished by the electorate? No, I don't accept that at all. Um, uh, I think it was right for the United Kingdom to leave the European Union. I supported it. 
DUP has been a Brexit party before most other parties were ever. Um, in that position, the DUP has long held the view that the United Kingdom was better off out. And there are many reasons for that. And I don't think it was a given that because the United Kingdom voted to leave the European Union, that Northern Ireland should be treated differently. Uh, I think that we could have arrived at practical outcomes that would have protected Northern Ireland's place within the UK, but avoided a hard border in the island of Ireland. And I don't accept that constitutional change was an inevitable consequence of Brexit. Why would it be? You know, the principle of consent is there and it protects Northern Ireland's place within the union. So, um, I, I, and support for the union remains strong. This myth that is perpetuated by some that Brexit weakens support for the union, there's no evidence of that. The opinion polls consistently point to support for the union in the high 60s heading towards 70%. Support for the Union in Northern Ireland is much stronger than support for the Union in Scotland. And yet Scotland doesn't have a, a protocol. Scotland isn't treated any differently from England as a result of Brexit. But support for, for Scottish independence is stronger than support for United Ireland in Northern Ireland. So I don't agree with the premise that uh, Brexit mean, inevitably meant constitutional change. And there isn't support for constitutional change in Northern Ireland or majority support. Support for the union in Northern Ireland is holding up very well. But wouldn't you say that the, the need for the protocol in Northern Ireland is because of the, the very unique situation of having a land border with the EU, which isn't present, obviously, in the, in the Scottish yeah, situation? In, in 2016, after the referendum, Arlene Foster as First Minister and Martin McGuinness as Deputy First Minister wrote a joint letter to the UK government and the EU saying, look, we recognise in the context of Brexit that there will have to be distinct arrangements that take account of the circumstances of Northern Ireland and you know, having a, a land border with the EU. We've never resiled from that. I think the protocol is way over the top in terms of what was necessary. You know, the, the fact that today on the Irish Sea, we have more checks on goods tra flowing across the Irish Sea than we have on goods flowing into the port of Rot Rotterdam, which is one of the most busiest ports in the world. It's just crazy. I mean, it is overkill. Most of the goods flowing across the Irish Sea never leave the United Kingdom. And yet they're subject to customs checks, SPS checks, all kinds of stuff that is unnecessary. So I think where we need to get to is a sensible arrangement that enables, um, you know, that reassures the, the EU that where goods are flowing into the European Union and into the single market, that those goods meet EU standards. And I think that can be done, that can be achieved, and it doesn't require. And the EU accepts, please note, that in its recent proposals, the EU um, uh, has put forward uh, suggestions that would lead to a significant reduction in the level of checks. Now, to me, that is a tantamount, that is a tacit acceptance that what they, they imposed originally was way, way over the top. So, you know, I think we need to reset that. Um, so we've never said that there shouldn't be arrangements that respect the political institutions, and the fact that we have a land frontier with the European Union, but you know they they don't need to be anywhere near um, the extent that is covered by the protocol. Um, should we take another floor question then? Um, in blue, there. So just given the fact that there's kind of been increased calls for a border poll within the next five years, so I think it's about two thirds of voters in Northern Ireland are looking for one. Um, and given the fact that would likely be quite close, how, firstly, how would the DUP feel about a border poll or a referendum in the next five years? And secondly, if that did come out in favour of a united Ireland, North and South, how do you see the DUP reacting in the role of unionism going forward? Well, thank you for your question. And I don't see a border poll in the next five years. I don't think there's a great appetite for a referendum. I think it would be very divisive. Um, it, it would polarise um, the politics in Northern Ireland. But we accept there are people, and particularly Sinn Féin, who are pushing for a border poll. Uh, interestingly, most of the political parties in the Republic don't think um, that a border poll should take place in the near future. So I don't think there will be a border poll in the next five years. If there were, and the people of Northern Ireland voted 
to leave the United Kingdom, um, then you know the principle of consent is exercised. I would deeply regret such a decision, deeply regret such a decision. That is not an outcome I want to see. And I think unionism needs to up its game. I think unionist parties need to be much more proactive in making the case for the union. I don't think we've done enough to make the case for the union. I think the case for the union is strong. And uh, we, we have recently established um, a new foundation which will undertake proper academic research in presenting the case for the union and put it out there and, and get that debate. But I'm not afraid of a debate about the future of Northern Ireland. I'm not afraid about that. And I'll, I won't run away from that debate. But I do think unionism needs to up its game in terms of presenting the case for the union. And I, if we do that, I'm confident we can win a border poll. I know that we started late, but I'm keen to get in some more um, audience participation. So if you don't mind, um, we've probably got time for at least one more question. Um, in the grey, I know you've been quite animated throughout. Um, it wouldn't be like me to be animated on Northern Irish politics. Um, so Geoffrey, I'm getting tired of the main parties in the executive playing fast and loose with the institutions. The main reason I got involved, interested in politics was 2017 when the institutions collapsed and as a 14 year old at that time thought, what is my future? Because there didn't seem to be a future. We had an election and that didn't resolve anything and we had three years where rating lists spiralled out of control and they still have not yet been fixed. You talk of the need for an assembly, a legislative body. Um, but the issue of if a government is compelled to influence and um, ensure that things are implemented. We can't have an assembly without the executive. We know that's how the structures work. The assembly right now has so many crucial bills going through it. We've got organ donation, we've got adoption, we've got protection from stalking, we've got committal reform, we've got integrated education, and that's just to name a few. Bills that will literally save lives. We both know and have worked with the Secretary of State we know that if um, the DUP or any other party collapse dormant today, tomorrow, in the next few weeks, he will not move for an election before May. So why can we not cut this rhetoric for the next three or four months, wait until March when Perda starts, and just get to work for the people of Northern Ireland? Because I, as a young person, I'm getting fed up. We're wasting opportunities. Northern Ireland is a fantastic place. It is a place with great culture, great economic and political opportunities. Can we please just embrace them and end the divisive rhetoric? Thank you. Thank you. And look, I understand your frustration. And, um, you know, such is the nature of Northern Ireland politics that it, at times it, it has this kind of roller coaster situation. Um, but the path to peace is never easy. And um, often there are bumps on the way. Um, Brexit, I think, and the protocol has obviously created a situation where you know, things that had settled down have um, risen again in terms of the public discourse. We can't ignore that. Um, I don't want to be in a position where, um, uh, or see our political institutions collapse. I recognize and agree with you that there's a lot to be done. Um, we have a lot of catching up to do. We're not just catching up on the three years that we lost out on with no, no local executive, but, you know, 30 years of conflict where there was a massive deficit in investing in our infrastructure, for example. Um, and, and, and there's huge potential. I'm, I'm actually very excited about the prospects in Northern Ireland. I think that if we can get over the hump of the protocol, if we can deal with this, and that's why I want a focus. So look, when, you, when you're one political party of five and an executive, and I wish it were otherwise, you know, one of the levers you can use is your participation. And I've sought to use that lever, not to be disruptive, but actually to focus minds on getting a solution. And from the moment I said what I said at the beginning of September, we've gone from a position where the EU said, no, we will not be renegotiating the protocol, to a position where the EU are now around the table with the UK government, and they are renegotiating these things. So I feel that the steps I took have brought a focus to what needed to be done, and with that having happened, I'm prepared and have given time for those negotiations. I want to see where they go. I've made that clear. I'm not going to, you know, do something precipitative without giving these negotiations the opportunity to 
make progress, and that's what I want to see happen. I do think we're going to get an outcome here. I do think that one way or the other, action is going to be taken to address particularly the, the, the friction on trade between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And if we can resolve those issues and the problems created by the Irish Sea border, then, you know, we can, we, 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 yes, we can get on with the business. And I want to see those bills go through the Assembly. I want to see the Assembly being successful. To its credit, the Assembly has been doing more legislation in this term than it did in previous terms, even though the term is shorter than it otherwise would have been. I'm an optimist. Um, one of the things that encourages me on my journey um, in politics is, you know, when I look at the mountains in front of us, the challenges that we face, they're certainly no higher than the ones we've already overcome. And when you look at Northern Ireland and the Northern Ireland you grew up in, you know, we've come a long way from the, the, the dark days of the Troubles. And, you know, that is down to a lot of the political leaders who are doing their best in difficult circumstances to take Northern Ireland forward. And we do want to move forward. And as I said in response to an earlier question, I want us to get to a place quickly where we are more focused on the future than we are on the past. So look, I, as a young person, you've spoken, I think, for many young people in Northern Ireland who just want to see Northern Ireland moving forward, who want to get over these difficulties and get focused on the big issues that can really transform Northern Ireland into the kind of place that it has the potential to be. So I, I hear what you say, and I hope we can get to a place soon where that stability is there and the focus is much more on um, looking forward rather than looking back. I'm aware of the fact that we're now nearly 30 minutes um, running over the time we were originally supposed to conclude, but I'll take just one more question. Um, this man here. Hi, everyone. I'm Samuel Abraham from Selwyn College. Um, I'm just reminded uh, off the back of what you're saying about the tensions that COVID's brought um, to the system. This week in the news, the Health Minister of Northern Ireland, uh, Robin Swan, has been uh, vocal about his um, hope to see vaccine passports in state in Northern Ireland. Is Robin Swan merely flapping his wings? What, how will the DUP um, reconcile the flagrant um, damage to civil liberties that that course of action will, will cause. Thank you. Well, that uh, that is a, today a big issue and the executive is meeting as we speak to discuss Robin Swan's proposal, so I don't know the outcome of that, but we do have concerns. Um, look, what is the objective of these COVID passports? If it is to take the pressure off the health service, I'm not convinced that it will secure that objective. But I want to look at the evidence. I want to see what the chief medical officer is saying. It hasn't worked in the Republic of Ireland, where they've had COVID passports for some time, and infection rates are going up and up at the moment. Um, uh, the um, I think in terms of where our health service is, um, there are far more people in hospital at the moment who should be at home, but we can't get domiciliary care packages for these elderly people literally hundreds of them in every trust who's, who want to be at home with their families but can't leave hospital because um, there isn't a domiciliary care package for them. There are far more people in that category in hospital than there are with COVID. And, and if we could deal with that issue, that would significantly ease the pressure on the health service in Northern Ireland at a relatively modest cost. So, you know, I think that um, I'm not convinced, put it this way, I, I understand where Robin Swan is coming from, but I am not convinced that, that the measure he's talking about is the answer to the pressures on the health service. And I know that there are many, including many people who are doubly vaccinated, who are concerned about the extent to which the state interferes in, in their civil liberties. I understand that argument. Of course, the health arguments have to be taken fully into account. The medical evidence and the science has to be considered. What Robin Swan is proposing is perhaps a bit more balanced than was originally mooted in that it's not just a question of being doubly vaccinated. So you have three options. If you want, for example, to go to a nightclub or to go to a large event with lots of people there, you have three options, either a certificate showing you're doubly vaccinated or a lateral flow test, 
um, showing a negative result within the last 48 hours, or um, that you've had COVID within the last 180 days and therefore have a degree of uh, built-in immunity. So actually, it isn't. This is not his proposal. Is not saying you don't get in here uh, unless you're vaccinated. It actually gives people a number of options, which covers most, I think, of society. But you're right to raise the issue. I think that we we need to consider the medical evidence, the science, and and actually does this achieve what Robin Swan wants to achieve, which is to ease the pressure on the health service. Those are the kind of issues our ministers will be looking at today when they meet in the executive. I hope the executive can arrive at some kind of a consensus on this. Um, But at the moment, I think the view of my party is that we're not convinced that this measure um, is going to actually fix the problem in terms of rising infection rates and easing the pressure on the health service. I think we really need to be looking at other things to ease the pressure on the health service, not least the recruitment of more medical staff, including nurses, but also the funding of domiciliary care packages. And frankly, the people who work in the care sector, giving them a decent package. I mean, the people who work in domiciliary care, they're paid, their pay is is, is just not... Um, uh, anywhere nearly adequate. Their terms and conditions of employment are wrong. We can't attract people to work in that sector. And the result is elderly, vulnerable patients staying in hospital much longer than they need to at a time, winter, when they are very vulnerable to infections in hospitals. And what does that do in terms of putting pressure on the health service? So there's an area where we we feel we should be focusing on, and that is part of the solution in terms of easing the pressure on the health service. I'm afraid that's all we're going to have um, time for today. Thank you all so much for coming and for sticking around. I know we're uh, overrunning our allotted time. And thank you so much, Sir Geoffrey. Um, it's been great to have you here. Thank you.